joined us. Thanks for tuning in. My name's Carrie. My name is Josh. We're so excited you're here tonight for church. We're seeing so many of you are checking in tonight, sharing on Facebook, on YouTube, and in our platform. We'd love for you right now to go ahead and share tonight's message. You're going to be encouraged, blessed. We got Pastor Dan preaching tonight. Oh yeah, Come Pastor on. Dan. It's going to be amazing. So right now, go ahead, take tonight's message, share it with somebody. And uh, I hope you're out there staying cool. It's getting hot, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, I know one of my favorite ways to stay cool when it gets hot is to go get a Chick-fil-A frosted lemonade. Come on, somebody. Oh, yeah. And so, Carrie, tell us about our giveaway tonight for people that check in. Yeah. With everyone that checks in, there's going to be a link that pops up on the screen. You can simply click that button. It takes about 30 seconds to check in, and you will be eligible to win a $25 Chick-fil-A gift card. We actually just went to Chick-fil-A yesterday for some <laughs> breakfast. 
And I will admit, the breakfast is also really good. Really so. good, really good. And you can actually buy a lot of frosted lemonades for $25. It's true. It's Let's true. go. Well, hey, we got a lot of great things that are coming up here at Eastridge Church. And, and hopefully you do take a moment, check in, let us know you're here. But there's a couple of other things that we would love for you to participate in. And those two things I want to bring your attention to is number one, our Alpha course. Alpha is an amazing way for not only you to grow deeper in your faith, but build a phenomenal foundation for what following Jesus is all about. It's also a great place to invite someone who maybe isn't a believer to come and, and have some of their deep questions answered about faith. And these are going to be uh, every week on Zoom, so you gotta don't got to yeah. worry about wearing a mask or social distance. It's all going to be online. All you got to do is text the word Alpha Course to 97,000. And that way we'll get you all the information about Alpha. The other thing we'd love to have you participate in is called Next. And Next is a phenomenal way for you to simply take your next steps here at Eastridge Church. It's how you learn about our foundations of faith, but also how you get plugged in in deeper ways of being involved in serving and leading. It's a great way for you to get deeper connected here at Eastridge Church. And again, just in the same way as Alpha Course, all you have to do is text the words next class to 97,000, and we'd love to get you all the information that you need for next. Speaking of being connected, tonight at 7 p.m., we actually have outdoor church. Come on! It has become the highlight of our week. It's so great. To gather together, to worship, to have Pastor Dan share again tonight. So if you want to jump in your car after this broadcast, you can catch us at 7 p.m. There's still room to register, but we also will be doing it next week. And I will say we've been blessed with some great weather Absolutely. for outdoor church. So it, man, don't bring, miss bring it. Bring the fan, bring the SPF. It's gorgeous tonight. So come hang with us. Big shout out online to the Norris family who's joining us. Candace who's joining us from Florida. I saw Ron Brown, Julie Steven. We're so grateful you're on here tonight. And we do want to remind you not only share tonight's message, but also take a moment and check in. Checking in is just a simple way to let us know you're here. Help us better serve you, stay connected with you, and uh, also get a chance to enter in to win that $25, $25 to Chick-fil-A. Chick yeah. Hey, at the end of tonight's message, there is going to be an opportunity like we do every single week, not only for you to respond to the message, but also a chance for you to participate in communion. We would really encourage you to take a moment right now, maybe gather some of those elements so you're prepared, grab some bread, grab some juice out of the kitchen and uh, get yourself ready because not only is it going to be a phenomenal message and a chance for you to, to engage, but Pastor Dan's going to be leading us through communion tonight. It's going to be incredibly powerful. So true. I also see Thad shouting us out tonight. And Thad is hey, actually Thad. playing the keyboard. Thad is in high school and on the worship team Come and just on. crushing it. So we're happy to have you on tonight, Thad. Absolutely. In fact, uh, it's always interesting when we, when we get to host like this. I always joke around with Kara. I'm like, hey, you better run off screen because you got to go lead worship oh boy. in just a few moments. But we are getting ready to enter into an incredible time of worship. And I know it may sometimes feel a little bit awkward in your living room to crank up the volume, stand up off the couch. But we'd encourage you, no matter where you are, the presence of God is yeah. there with you. Yeah. And so don't just allow these worship times to be something you observe on your phone or on your screen. But we'd encourage you, stand up, take some time. Press into the presence of God. Open your heart to experience everything that he has for you tonight. Even though, uh, I love what Pastor Larry's been saying these last few weeks. It's it one is. of my favorite yeah. phrases. In Even the midst of though all of this. we are distant, we are not disconnected. Come on, that's and that's right. truly what we believe. So join us. Let's worship tonight. And, and just experience God in a new way. I'm just so excited to hear from Pastor Dan. If you didn't catch that, he is preaching tonight yep. and tomorrow. So be sure to get your notepads ready because he's got good stuff for us. That's right. Hit the like button, share, and have an incredible service. Hey, church, we're so glad that you're joining us right now. Why don't you stand on your feet wherever you're at? Just worship with us.
Amen, amen. I love that song. Boy, we needed that today, didn't we? Just to hear that song, Waymaker. Even though you may not feel it, even though you may not see it, our God is always at work. Some of you today, you've needed that right now just to come and encourage you, to remind you, to lift you up, and to let you know that God indeed sees you exactly right where you are. He loves you, He cares for you. And I'm gonna pray for you today as the family of Eastridge. And I just want to again tell you how much we love you. We're praying for you every single day. Some of you are brand new to us watching this worship service today. And I just want to welcome you to feel that you're a part of this incredible family that we call Eastridge. And we are having outdoor services on Saturdays at 7 p.m. And we're focusing on getting back into church on September 13th. But I want to tell you right now, that we as the family of God are moving forward. We're taking ground by faith and by prayer. And I just wanna pray over you right now. So wherever you are, wherever you're watching this, even whatever time you are, I want you just to even feel the freedom today to lift a hand toward heaven and call on the power of the living God and just know he's gonna hear our prayer. He's gonna step into your life. He is the God of the way of the who is the way maker. He's the God of the breakthrough. He's the God of the miraculous. And I'm so glad to, that we can come together right now and put our faith and our hope in him. So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I just pray over every person. Lord, you know deep inside of our hearts, even in the quiet place that isn't even shared with anyone else. Lord, you know exactly what we have need of the fears, the anxieties, the uncertainties, the promises that are yet to be fulfilled, the dreams that are yet to be fulfilled. And God, I just pray right now that you will take dominion, you'll take authority. Come on, church, pray with me. Take dominion, God, over our lives. Take authority over every place. God, even in our weaknesses and our fears, step fresh into our lives. You are the way maker. So God, I pray you'll provide for your people. I pray, Lord, that you'll take care of them. I pray that fresh dreams will even live inside of each and every one of them. Lord, we pray over our nation. We pray over our president, members of Congress. We pray, Lord, over our governor and those in authority over us. God, we pray that you will begin a healing process in our nation, even in our streets, dear God. Let the name of Christ and the message of Jesus go forth in our day and in our time that, God, we could see you bring people to a place of miracles and breakthroughs. And we just give you thanks today, God. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Can you give a big amen? Amen and amen. God bless you. Welcome to Eastridge Church. We're so glad that you joined us today. We would love to know that you are here with us. So take a moment and click the button in the chat to check in or go to eastridgetoday.com slash check in to let us know that you're watching. Every service, we're gonna pick one lucky name and give away a fun prize. So don't miss out on your chance to win. If you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook, we would love for you to join our online experience at eastridgetoday.com. There, you can chat with a pastor, request prayer, or easily give online with the click of a button. You can even set up recurring giving so that you never miss out on the opportunity to be a blessing to the work of God through Eastridge Church. Don't forget to stay up to date with us on social media or at eastridgetoday.com. And once again, thanks for joining us. It is such a joy, such a privilege. Every single week, we're looking forward to this moment where we can gather together in the name of the Lord. So welcome. Thank you for being here today. You're going to get a great word right out of the scripture. We're in our series, Living Hope. But before we get into the word today, I want to lead us in one of the high places of worship in our lives. We've lifted our hands today. We have sung our, our heart and our worship unto God. But there's a big place also, and some of you may, who are brand new to faith or brand new to church, you may not know this, but a great and important place of worship in our life is what we know as generosity or giving back unto the Lord. 
Basically, what the Bible teaches us is that God is the author of our life. He gives us what is most important. First of all, that is salvation, a new relationship with God. But then he also promises to walk with us, to talk with us. Aren't you glad for that? And to take care of us, to meet every need that is in our lives because he loves and he cares for us. But the other thing that God's word teaches us is that he wants to be acknowledged as the author of our life. He wants to be acknowledged that we would always have faith that who we are and what we have is not just because of ourselves, but it's because of the amazing love and the amazing gifts of God. And so he calls for us to give back unto him. It's known even as a tithe. That, mean, that word means a tenth. To give back unto God out of all of the things that he has blessed us with, that we could be a blessing to others. And I want you to know that God wants this not to be a place of a bondage or restriction, but a place of great joy. And that's what I have learned, and my wife and I have learned together, to just walk with God, trust him. And many of you you know exactly what I'm talking about, and to let God bring his blessing full force in our lives, and it's because we trust him, we obey him, and we sow. Here's what the scripture says. The apostle Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 and following, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each man should give what he's decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly, or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I love that. And then the, la the next verse, verse 8 says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, I love this right here, COVID-19, listen up, that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Somebody should give some praise to God right there. And then he goes on in verse 10, he says this, now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So what I want us to see today is that there's an amazing miracle that comes into our life through grace and through giving. When we trust God, we honor God, he just does amazing things in our lives. And he says this, I'm going to give you bread to eat. I'm going to take care of you but I'm also going to entrust to you seeds that are meant to be sown. And if we can keep those two things in proper order, not live in fear, not live in anxiety, not live with a hold back attitude, but live in obedience and faith to God, he's gonna show us, he's gonna teach us, and he's gonna meet our needs. So today, church, I wanna encourage you. Go to one of our platforms. I wanna encourage you to sign up even for, for reoccurring gifts that helps us all stay on track with God, even right here in the heart of the sun. Aren't you glad we're, we're enjoying one of the warmest weekends of the entire year? But I want to encourage you to be generous, to be faith-filled, and to sow the seeds that make ministry happen. Boy, our world needs it. Our community needs it. West Seattle needs it. Issaquah, the I-90 corridor. We need the presence of God. So today, join me, would you? And let's sow, let's sow big, and let's believe God that he's going to use our lives, he's going to use our church. Some of you last week had an opportunity to sow towards priority one with Sam Johnson. We didn't reach quite the mark that we were hoping for. Maybe you missed that service and you'd still like to be a part. You can do that on our, on our different platforms. All right, church, I'm going to pray for you. I love you. I'm standing with you in faith. I'm believing God for the greatest days we have ever seen in our lives. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you for your people. I thank you for this amazing body. I thank you for being able to even be the pastor of Eastridge, to be in relationship with your people. And I thank you, Lord, for, for all that you're doing in the midst of your people. And I pray that even as we sow today seeds of even sacrifice, seeds of faith, Lord, may we be used by you to touch our community and even reach around the world with hope in the name of Jesus. And we give you praise, God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for your faithful giving. Well, welcome everybody. My name is Dan Matier. I'm the Family Life Pastor 
here at Eastridge Church. It's an honor to be able to speak the word of God to you today. And I've loved this Living Hope series. Hasn't this been a great series? One of the things that I'm just really impressed by and impacted by is how we walk through this book just chapter by chapter, just verse by verse, taking the next verse in order as it was written hundreds, even thousands of years ago, how specifically, how uniquely it speaks right to the situation we are in, right to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And I'm so thankful for a pastor and a leader who's led by the Word of God, who preaches the Word of God, who doesn't back down from speaking the truth of God's Word, but proclaims it loudly and lets that Word guide him. So thank you, Pastor Steve, for leading us well, and thank you for the opportunity to preach today. We're going to continue through 1 Peter chapter 3, and we're in 1 Peter 3.13. I encourage you to grab your Bible or a device, the Bible app, whatever you have. Just follow along with us and let God's work speak into your heart. In fact, let's just pray right now and, and pray that God's Holy Spirit would prepare us to hear his word today. Lord, we thank you that you gave us your word, your living and active word. And Lord, I thank you uh, that your word speaks right to us. As as uh, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, that it speaks right to uh, where we are, like a double-edged sword penetrating through the bone and the marrow, judging the attitudes of a man's heart. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I pray, God, today that your word would speak deeply into our heart, right into every situation that's represented here in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's start with uh, 1 Peter 3.13. It says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Remember where we are in this book, this letter of 1 Peter. It was written by Peter to encourage the believers scattered around the world around Asia Minor as an encouragement to them, new believers who are finding themselves under persecution and suspicion from government, uh, from their society, even some of them from their very own household members. And Peter writes this as an encouragement. And as Pastor Steve preached last week earlier in this chapter, he said that, that as they live out the calling that God has given to them, that they should be sympathetic that they should love one another, to be compassionate and humble. And here he says, do good. Live out the good that God has given to you because if you do good, what harm is going to come of you? But even if you should suffer, you will be blessed. In other words, he says, you're going to be okay. But if you're not, you're still going to be okay. And how many of you need to hear that message and that word today in 2020? As we look around, as we're confused, as we're panicked maybe a little bit, you are going to be okay. But even if you're not, you're still going to be okay. I found myself saying this uh, to myself over and over in a unique circumstance I was in this past week. Uh, My wife and I got to spend a really beautiful uh, little little getaway at a a place called Diablo Lake in the North Cascades. And I drove by this a few years ago. And and the water in Diablo Lake is this bright, brilliant turquoise blue. It's amazing. And just as I was driving through, I said, I got to come back here. This place is awesome. Then I found out that on Diablo Lake, they have campsites that you cannot get to in a car. In fact, you can't even get to them on foot. The only way you can get to these campsites is by non-motorized boat, a canoe or kayak. And when I heard that, I said, count me in. That sounds awesome. Now, my wife is the more cautious in our relationship, a little, a little bit you know, more concerned, thinks through the details of things. Well, I'm just headstrong. Let's go do it. She said, you know, that does sound like fun, but what happens if we were to tip over, if we were to capsize? What happened if all of our stuff washed away? If our boat sinks to the bottom of the lake, where do we go? What do we do? And I kind of looked at this and researched this, and, and then we came to a point, she came to a point where she said, okay, that sounds awesome. Let's give it a try. So we did it. And we went out, and I said, you know, you don't have really anything to worry about. It's not like it's a river. It's not like we're going to run into rapids, right? It's a lake, How bad could it be? It was a lake. So we put all of our stuff, our camping stuff, in this canoe, and we paddled out, and it was beautiful. This is just a few days ago. So beautiful. 
But as we paddled out of the cove and turned the corner, we hit a huge headwind, bigger than anything I'd expected. And if you're in a, on a hike or in a car, a wind's not that big of a deal. But when you're in a canoe with two people and hundreds of pounds of stuff, it's kind of a big deal. Well, maybe 100 pounds of stuff. We started to rock back and forth. We had to turn the canoe into the waves so that we wouldn't tip over. And water started coming up over the bow of the boat with these white cap waves. Rebecca went from paddling to bailing water out of the boat. She kept saying, are we going to be okay? I said, don't worry, we're going to be okay. And that went from, we're going to be okay, but even if we're not, we're still going to be okay because we had life jackets, right? And we had extra life jackets in case those failed us. And we had dry bags. But then we started talking like this. What are we going to do if we do capsize? Where are we going to go? How are we going to get to shore? And at one point she asked me, what are you going to miss most if everything we brought sinks to the bottom? And I realized this could be a very different trip than I thought it was going to be. Now, the end of the story is this. We got there safely and had a fabulous time, even though there were eight or nine places where I thought we were going to tip over. But we had to come to this way of thinking. We're going to be okay. But even if we're not, we're going to be okay because there's another level of preparation. Now, maybe it's not going to look like we thought it was going to look. Maybe things are not going to be as we expected them. And maybe we're going to lose some superficial things along the way, but it's going to be okay. And that's the message that Peter is preaching to the church here. Church, it's going to be okay, but even if it's not, you will be blessed. Your job is just to keep on doing good, just to keep on doing what you know is right. If you suffer, God will use it. Because we know, right? We know that if we do wrong, there's consequences for that. There's consequences from the law. There's consequences from our society. If we do wrong, there's consequences for that. But if we do right and we suffer for it, God sees that. And God is not going to waste that because God has a good plan. He has a plan for your life. It's a, a plan that has a hope and a future, and it's an efficient plan. God is not going to waste anything like that in your life. If you suffer for doing good, God will use it for his good. So that message to Peter, that, that Peter was say, saying to the church is a message for you too. You're going to be okay. If you stick to God, if you keep following his word, keep following after him, you're going to be okay. But even if you're not, you're still going to be okay. Now the word that he says, that Peter says, is uh, that we should be eager to do good. That word eager is the same word, Greek word, that they use for zealots that we should be zealous to do good. We should be passionate to do good. We should be excited about it. We should plan to do it, dream to do it. And church, imagine what the church would look like if we all woke up in the morning eager, zealous to say, God, how can I do your good today? In spite of whatever comes, whether I suffer for it or not, I want to do your good, not passively, but zealously actively, passionately. That's what we've been called to do, church. And that's what we've been called to live out. As we look back in the scripture in verse 14, it says in 1 Peter 3, 14, do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened, but in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. This is a test of our motivation here. Because if we're motivated out of fear, we can't zealously do good. E, that passionate good does not come out of fear. It's got to come out of Christ. And Christians, we cannot be motivated by fear because we put our hope in Jesus, right? That's what a Christian is. We put our hope in Jesus. And hope means trust. We put our trust in Jesus. And if we are trusting in Jesus, it means we are acknowledging and believing he's got the plan, he's in control, he's all powerful, therefore there can be no fear on our part if we trust him. If we trust that he is who he says he was, he is, that we believe who he says he is, we cannot operate out of fear. This is a litmus test for our own faith. Now, here in the footnote, if you look at it in verse uh, 15, it, or 14, it says, 
do not fear their threats. And, and maybe in your Bible, there's a little footnote of how else that could be translated. Down at the bottom of the page, it says, or do not fear what they fear. Do not fear their threats or do not fear what they fear. And it's challenging to live without fear in a society that lives in fear, that deals in fear, that thrives on fear, that wants to spread fear as much as they can. It's challenging to stand up in that environment, and I know it, but our call is to rise above it. Our call is to be led by the Holy Spirit, to listen to Jesus, to hold on to him. Our calling is to live out hope in a way that reflects hope. In fact, in a way that causes other people to ask us about it, to ask, why do you have this hope? How could you have this hope? Haven't you noticed? Haven't you looked around? How could you have hope in the midst of what's going on? That's our call. Look at the next verse, what it says in 1 Peter 3, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. Now, that is probably the most quoted verse in uh, 1 Peter. Uh, I remember uh, hearing that as a, as a teen, as a young person, and, and it felt like kind of a, an English assignment for me. I had an essay assignment, right, that I had to write down the hope that I had in kind of a 90-second elevator pitch that I could give to somebody if they asked me, why do you have hope in Jesus? Well, I'm glad you asked, right? And get it out there. And hear me out. That's good. You should have a clear, concise reason why you have hope in Jesus. If somebody says, why do you hope in Jesus? You should be able to tell them in a few short sentences why you do have that hope and have it make sense. But when we consider this just an essay assignment that we can check off and go, got my testimony written, we miss another layer of this. We miss a layer of this because what's being uh, said here is we shouldn't just be able to tell people why we had hope, but why we have hope. Not what did God do, but what is God doing? What's he doing today? I remember as a, a young person preparing my testimony, uh, I, I was a generally well-behaved church kid and kind of had a feeling of, of uh, regret, and, and not, not regret, but a little bit of disappointment, you know what I mean, that I didn't have this radical testimony that God hadn't saved me out of this life of drug addiction and crime and vices and had this amazing story how I used to be part of this devil-worshipping biker gang and now look at me here today. Because that's a good story, right? And, and hey, if that's your story, I want to hear that. I want to celebrate that. And it's awesome that God delivers drug addicts. And it's awesome that he turns lives around. And I love it. But glorifying that kind of testimony and saying, that's what a testimony needs to look like, misses out on the fact that God, it doesn't just work one time in our life. He works every single day. And so our call, people of God, is to pay attention to what God is doing now. What is he doing today? Not just when you came to salvation, although that's important. Not just when you had physical healing years ago, although that's awesome and we want to celebrate that. But what God doing today? And in order to know that, in order to see that, we've got to pay attention. Now, I had a little lesson in paying attention this past week. I had an eventful week. There was, uh, in my neighborhood, there was a guy across the street from me um, who was having car trouble. Now, I live on a really quiet street, so the fact that there would be somebody on the street was notable as it was. And he was there for like two or three hours. But I just didn't worry much about it, right? Until he came knocking at my door asking if we had a gas can that we could help him start his car with. And so I brought the gas can out there, filled it with gas, and the car wouldn't turn over. It became evident he didn't need gas. He needed a jump start. And so he popped open the hood, and he didn't know where his battery was. Now, hey, not everybody's a car guy. You don't have to know where your battery was. But it made me think, wait a minute, how do you not know where your battery is? In fact, he thought his battery had been taken even though he drove his car there. I don't know a ton about cars, but I know your car doesn't work if it doesn't have a battery. So I started to suspect something was up. 
As soon as I suspected something was up, I thought, you know what? This might not be this guy's car. He may have stolen this car. And so I walked around to the back to take a look at the license plate, and guess what? There was no license plate. It had been ripped off. And I looked inside the car and noticed now that the glove box and the other compartments had been pulled out. Everything was trashed and ransacked, registration and owner's manual are all over along with a lot of other junk. There was a woman's wallet in the door of the car. And then I began to remember that hours earlier, when the guy first started having car trouble, he had set off the car alarm. Okay, I've done that in my own car. Then I thought back to when my 10-year-old son told me, Dad, I think that guy is trying to steal that car. It all, the evidence was out there. I just didn't pay attention. But once I considered and realized the truth of the situation, the evidence was all around me. I texted my wife, she called the police, and six minutes later, the guy was in handcuffs on his way to jail. He had a warrant out for his arrest and he was a wanted criminal. I almost jump-started his car and got him. Anyway, the lesson is when we realize and see the truth, the evidence is all around us. And here's the truth. Here's the truth for us today. God is at work in your life. That's truth. You can bank on that. You can build a life on that. God is at work in your life. And when you acknowledge that, when you realize that God is working for you, that he's working on your behalf, that he's fighting for you, he's interceding for you, that God is working to bless you, to build a future and a hope in your life, when you come to terms and acknowledge that as truth, your life's going to look different. You're going to see how he's working. You're going to see the hope that he's given you. The hope that he's given you not just one time, but unloading in you, downloading in your life, and in all of those around you. God is doing something great in your life. One of my favorite quotes is from Pastor John Piper. He said, God is doing 10,000 things in your life all the time, and you might be aware of three of them. Church, we're called to be aware of what God's doing in our life, to point, point it out. And, and I want to give you just quickly three things. If you're taking note, of, I, I encourage you to write these down. Three things you can do to help you pay attention to the hope that you have in Jesus. Pay attention to what he is doing in your life. The first thing is to ask him for things. That means pray. Now, that might, if you're new to prayer or, or maybe you just never thought this way, that might seem selfish on your part. Oh, I can't ask God for things. I, I can't inconvenience God. I don't want to be greedy. I don't want to be selfish. You know what? Jesus doesn't see it that way. He sees it that when we ask him for things, we're becoming dependent on him. Jesus told us over and over, ask him. Come to him. Ask from our Father above. Ask and you will receive, seek, and you will find, knock, and the door will be open to you. Ask God to work in your life. Ask God to provide for you. Ask God to heal you. Ask God to touch your family. Because when we ask him for things, we can see how he's working in our lives. Pray out loud. Write it down. Journal your prayers. Pray with someone else. If you're married, I encourage you, pray with your spouse. My wife and I try to make it a daily habit to pray together. And we had a day just this past week where she just prayed, uh, asked for three things that she needed prayer for, and I asked for three things I needed prayer for. And by the end of that day, we had seen God move in all six of those situations because we were paying attention, because we were keeping each other accountable and saying, hey, you know what? That was God. We asked him, and he came through for us. And the second thing we ask him, the second thing is give thanks to him. That's prayer too. When God does something in your life, acknowledge it. Acknowledge it to him and to yourself. Give thanks to God. Because you know what? When you live a life that ignores what God's doing, it can seem like just another bunch of stuff happened today. But when you look, when you pay attention, when you acknowledge what God is doing in your life, you can see it. You can proclaim it. And the third thing is tell other people about it. Talk about it. You know, you remember the stories that you tell, don't you? And as you tell about God's goodness, 
You remember his goodness. You encourage one another to pray. You encourage others to have faith. Even talk about it to people who don't know Jesus. Talk about what God's doing in your life to non-believing friends because it will give them a reason to ask you about the hope that you have. In fact, think about this. Do you know what the word agnostic means? Some people identify themselves as agnostic. Agnostic means there may be a God, but there's just no way of knowing. If that is how people feel who are unbelievers, they feel that there may be a God, but there's no way of knowing, let's give them a way of knowing. Let's show the hope. Let's talk about the hope. You know what? I think we are closed off more than people want us to be about what God is doing in our life. They may be wanting, be, may be wanting you to talk about your faith in God, even though they don't know how to have it or what to do. They want to know that you have faith that this God you believe in is alive, that he's working, that he's working on your behalf. So talk about it. Let's look at the next verse, uh, verse 15. Uh, continuing on with verse 15, it says, but do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. See, we are called to proclaim this hope that we have in a way that displays gentleness and respect. And it is uh, easy to talk about what God is doing in your life that does just the opposite, that talks about bitterness and mockery that doesn't draw people in to ask us about the faith that we have, but pushes people away. We need to constantly be reminding ourselves to do this in gentleness and respect, to talk about the hope that we have with not bitterness, not mockery, not condemnation of others, but in a way that draws them in. I want to get specific just briefly in a few things and remind us, it is good for us to be involved in politics. Church, you should vote. You know that? You should vote. And if God so leads, you should run for political office. But politics cannot be our source. It cannot be uh, what guides our worldview because politics, as a general rule, does a really poor job in gentleness and respect. Church, it is good for you to be connected with what's going on in the news what's going on in news media, to be aware of what's happening in our world, that's good. You should do those things. But that cannot be your source. That cannot be your foundation. That can't be your guide. Because as a general rule, news media does a really poor job at gentleness and respect. You should stay connected on social media. That's a good thing. You don't have to, but if you want to, that's awesome. Share your cat videos, share your pictures from the beach, but we can't get tangled up in silly arguments with people we may or may not have ever met because it doesn't draw out gentleness and respect. Our source needs to be scripture. Our source needs to be the Holy Spirit. Our foundation needs to be what we hear from our pastor, from other Christian brothers and sisters, encouraging one another and building one, each, uh, one another up in the faith. And we need to be asking ourselves as believers, what's influencing you? Where's your worldview coming from? Where is your direction coming from? Because it should be from the Holy Spirit. And when, it, there, it, when it's from the Holy Spirit, we will flow with gentleness and respect. And there will be peace in us. Not emptiness, not a feeling like we've been defeated or we've given in, but gentleness and respect for our brothers and sisters. Now, church, Peter tells us uh, that we need to do this in a way that doesn't repay insult for insult that doesn't repay uh, evil for evil, but does this in kindness and sympathy. And the reason he encourages this over and over through this chapter is he knows our temptation is to be the one who delivers the consequence. That's our, that's our temptation as, as people, isn't it? If somebody wrongs us, we don't want to just see them wronged. We want to be the one that delivers that wrong. 
We want to be the one. That's our, our natural fleshly temptation who delivers the consequences. But Peter's reminding us of something we need to remind ourselves of. That's not our job. That's God's job. Our job is to do what we know is right and let him deliver the consequences and let him bring justice in the world. As we follow the example of Christ and we do what is right and let God take control, because when we try to take control, we try to take God's spot. And when we try to take God's spot, our life gets out of balance. Things go awry. We need to let God have that place of authority in our life to do what we know is right, even if we suffer for it and say, God, you're the one who brings justice. You're the one who will bring stability in my life. Let's take a look at uh, the next passage of Scripture, verse 18. Now, I want to say before we read in this, there is a verse in here that uh, for, for many is very confusing. Uh, and and uh, there's, most theologians have not even really come to a, a grips on what Peter is trying to say here. It's kind of an obscure thing, so we'll read it. But I want to just say there is a beautiful truth here that he's trying to convey. So let's unpack this uh, as we go through. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with the angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Now, we could spend a lot of time trying to unpack what Peter is talking about there when he says uh, that the Spirit of Christ went to make proclamation to those who died in the time of Noah. Uh, and Martin Luther himself said he probably will never understand what Peter is trying to say there. But we know God has this heavenly perspective, that God knew what he was talking about. But here is the message that's trying to be proclaimed here, that's trying to be uh, conveyed. There's a metaphor at work. See, in the time of Noah, if you remember this story, God looked at the whole world and saw that it was wicked, saw that it was sinful, that it was, it was so wrapped up in e evil and sin that he didn't see how, uh, you know, it could be unraveled, that he almost even regretted ever creating man. But he saw the righteous man, Noah, and he said he was going to save mankind through Noah. He, Mo Noah and his family were brought onto the ark that God led Noah to build. And the whole world was wiped clean of sin through the flood. Now, that flood brought death and destruction, but it cleansed the world of sin. What Peter is saying here is that now, because of Jesus, the world can be cleansed of sin because of the, Christ, the sacrifice that Christ made on the cross, that anyone who puts faith in him can have their sins washed away, and we don't have to, it doesn't have to end in death and destruction, that our sins can be taken from us, and the water of the fl flood that washed away the sins of the world is now a new symbol in the water of baptism, that as we receive Christ, as we put faith in him, the water that's symbolized in baptism symbolizes eternal life, wiping clean of sin, cleansing and salvation for all of those who put faith in him. What a beautiful promise that is for you and me. And, you know, as we look at, at what it means to live a life for Christ, I, I believe there are some who are uh, hearing this and saying, that's not the life I live. I don't have a faith like that. I don't have faith in Jesus. What you today can put your faith in Jesus right now just by saying to him, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I want to be washed clean. I want to be made right and made new by you. I want to have that bitterness and, and hurt, anger and resentment washed away and let there be peace. Let there be gentleness. Let there be joy in me. I want to make you the leader, the Lord of my life. Be my savior today. And just by praying that prayer right now, Jesus will meet you where you are. The spirit of God will come in, make you new, 
make you whole, make you clean, and prepare a place in eternal life for you. And if that's you, just pray that prayer to him right now. And in fact, we encourage you, if you're doing that, just text the word RESPONSE to 97000. We want to partner with you and celebrate with you, just send you some information about next steps, uh, what it looks like to live a life for Jesus, how we live out this faith, faith together. And maybe you're here today and you're, you're just saying, hey, you know what, I have made a commitment to Christ, but my life doesn't look like this passage of Scripture talks about. I need to get some things right. I would encourage even you, text the word response to 97,000. Let us pray with you, help you in your next steps of faith to just set things right. We are a group of people who recognize we don't have everything figured out, but Jesus does, so we're following after him. So I encourage you, follow after him. Make a decision for him today. That pull, that tug on your heart, respond to that and turn your life over to Jesus today. In just a moment, we're going to receive communion together. So we're going to pray uh, and, and bless these elements. And if you are today making a decision for Jesus, I encourage you to do this. Just grab a piece of bread in your kitchen there, a little juice, what you have to drink, and receive this with us. This is a powerful symbol, something that Jesus told us to do. Let's pray as we acknowledge how God is working today. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. Thank you that we can be made new by you. Lord, that, that our sin can be washed away and it doesn't have to end in death, but it can end in life because of your sacrifice for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's receive communion together. The scripture uh, says, I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's receive the bread together. Jesus, we thank you for this bread representing your body. Mm. Scripture goes on to say, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord to death until he comes again. Let's receive the cup. Jesus, we give you thanks and praise. We honor you that you are the leader of our life. We pray that you'll bless our church, bless our nation, bless our community, and help all of those who follow you to be a blessing to others. Help us to remember what you've done, what you've done for us, and to follow your example every day in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us today. We encourage you to share this message. Invite somebody else to hear it. The power of the gospel has no limit. God is at work. Let's let him be at work through us. God bless you, church. Wow, what an amazing message by Pastor Dan. So grateful for the series that we've been in, in 1 Peter. And even as we were going through the text today, one of the things that really struck me as he was talking was just about the reality of when we become aware of what God is doing in our life, when we begin to see uh, what God is speaking to us, what he's doing in our life, all of a sudden we begin to see a different perspective and we can begin to see the ways that God has been moving, see his fingerprints and all of the different things that he's been doing in our life. Yeah, and I was also struck by the conclusion point he drew with just the cleansing power of Jesus yeah. and how no matter what we have come from, because of the, the grace and the sacrifice Jesus made for us, that we can be made new today. Yeah. And maybe that's you. Maybe you took a step of faith. Maybe you responded to that prayer. Pastor Dan just prayed. I just want to encourage you once again to text the word response to yeah. 97,000, just a simple word, but we will we would love to follow up with you and pray for you. Mm -hmm. One of our pastors is going to call you, and we just want to celebrate the decision that you've made today. Yeah, that's right. You may be watching right now, whether you're in your room or you're in your living room on your phone, tablet, whatever it may be, wherever you are, we want you to know that we're here. We would love to encourage you, pray with you, and solidify the choices and decisions that you're making in your heart today. So take that step, text in, click the button, let our team connect with you and pray with you, and let's, let's help take those next steps in your relationship with Jesus today. We got a lot of great things that we would love for you to continue to participate in. Obviously, we got drive-in church tonight. If you're looking to double dip, jump in the car, come join us. There's still spots available to sit 
or drive in. Uh, otherwise, we'd love for you to continue to share what's going on here at Eastridge Church, whether it's our weekend services or whether it's our upcoming ministries, whether it's Alpha, Next, or even when we're going to be back in the building. We're so excited to be back here in the building in, in September 12th and 13th. So be looking forward to that. Mark your calendar. It's going to be an incredible moment as we gather together again in the building as the church. Otherwise, we love you, church. Thank you so much for supporting the ministry, what's going on here. Thanks for joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you the rest of the week.